All right, everybody, welcome to the show. Uh, ben Mankiewicz, a syndicated columnist, uh, Tina Dupuis. Tina, how are you? Tina, you do everything. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a journalist and a columnist and a blogger, kind of not in that order, but uh, yeah, no, I right. do everything. Uh, you're also uh, very smart, very learned, make me look like an idiot. I know how to handle Cenk making me look like an idiot. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, Also, you making me look like an idiot, a little emasculating. Yeah? Yeah. What do you am think I say? Do you think it's the hair? Do you think it's, it's the blonde hair that you're like, you're so used to? Well, you have nice hair, no yeah. question. I mean, it's the, obviously it's the second nicest yeah. hair on set, but it's still okay. So my, oh, burn. <laughs> my attempts to emasculate you haven't been happening? No, you're fair. Really? Yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Um, you make me feel sort of inadequate in some ways. But uh, uh, that's uh, Jonathan Kim from uh, RethinkReviews.net, uh, uh, also here on the Young Turks uh, every Friday, uh, also uh, Huffington Post and K KPFK doing uh, uh, progressive movie reviews, as everyone who watches the show knew, <coughs> knows. Um, a Client Nine is the uh, documentary uh, from uh, the same guy who brought us Casino Jack, yes. right? Alex Gibney, who Alex also did uh, Taxi to the Dark Side, which he won the Oscar for. Right, which okay. was terrific. And Enron, the smartest guys in the room. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Okay. Uh, so he's done some pretty good stuff. I, I thought uh, Casino Jack was a little uh, long and got a little convoluted. Yeah, I haven't gotten to that one, but they're, you know they're actually doing a dramatic version with Kevin Spacey. Right, 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 right. Yeah, well, they did. It's already done, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. Was it like an HBO or something? No, it was out, right? I don't think it's out yet. But... That's what I saw. What am I talking about? I, that might, I think that might be doing festivals or something yeah. that hasn't had its... Anyway, I'm an idiot. Yeah, um, but he, he goes into the exclusive places to so, see his movies. Um, <laughs> yes. So uh, I can't remember. Um, I, by the way, I can't. I have to, like, check my notes to know what I've seen. Um, so, uh, but this is uh, the documentary on uh, on uh, on Elliot Spitzer. Yes, the rise and fall of Elliot Spitzer. And was it uh, so? First of all, was it, uh, did it was it? It's long. That's what struck me about it. It's close to two hours, which yeah. these days documentaries Pushing are trying to stick. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so they, tell they us. They all want to stick to the HBO format. Or hour and a half right. is the idea. That that's what only what Americans can handle. <laughs> By the way, I can barely handle an hour and a half of anything. <laughs> Um, so, uh, in fact, this show, it'll be like, I'm leaving in 23 minutes. <laughs> um, so, uh, all right, set it up. What's the deal with uh, Client 9? Well, it's basically about what happened to Elliot Spitzer, and it kind of goes beyond, I mean, because I think most people are just like, oh, yeah, that guy who, like, nailed hookers with the socks on, and that was, like, the whole story. But um, well, I think they know he was the governor. <laughs> Yeah. I bet a lot of America doesn't because all they heard was just, the only time they probably when they first heard about him was all when all the salacious stuff happened and then that kept going and going and right, going. Right, but you forever. wouldn't care unless he was governor, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it, they know he's a politician. Anyway, go on. But, I'm, yeah, I'm, they, being a, I'm yeah, being a yeah. I'm being a puss. Yeah. But yeah, it sort of it, it goes into first of all into the world of, of escort services, but also into all the sort of the shady dealings of how Republicans, as well as people on Wall Street, who he had pissed off while Attorney General, were really out to get him. And, his, and I mean, the movie does not at all try to exonerate him for, you know, for, uh, for going out with hookers, but saying that when it, when it happened, there was a coordinated effort to drag him down after that, which you don't see in a lot of other cases, as in David Bitter. All right, well, here is, uh, here is uh, Jonathan's uh, review of uh, Klein. I want to move on to the, to the Emperor's Club. When did that start, approximately? Sometime in 06. Early 06? Thereabouts, yeah. You were flying about as high as you could possibly be flying. I mean, this mm -hmm. was prior to... At that point in time, you were pretty certain you were going to be governor of New York. Which is right. Well, look, if your point is things were as good as they could get from a political perspective, I suppose that's right. And the only metaphor I can think of, perhaps, is Icarus. Those whom the gods would destroy, they make all powerful. In 2008, Elliot Spitzer, who was then the governor of New York, was named in a prostitution sting for hiring high-end escorts. Spitzer quickly resigned in shame. And that was the end of the story, right? Not if you watch Alex Gibney's new documentary, Client Nine, The Rise and Fall of Elliot Spitzer which shows, in trademark Gibney noir style, how Spitzer's infidelity provided a way for powerful enemies in the political and financial worlds to take down a man audacious enough to attempt to reform Wall Street and politics, right before both almost sank our economy.
While he was New York's Attorney General, Spitzer was known as the Sheriff of Wall Street, seeing that the obscene paychecks and loose ethics of the financial world could endanger the economy. So he took the unprecedented move of investigating America's top ten biggest financial firms, since their New York headquarters put them under his jurisdiction, getting them to pay $1.5 billion in settlements over conflicts of interest. Remember, Spitzer was Attorney General from 1998 to 2006, years before conflicts of interest like credit default swaps, subprime mortgages, and selling chopped up bad loans as safe securities sank the economy. Spitzer also went after Kenneth Langone, former chair of the New York Stock Exchange's Compensation Board, for awarding a $187.5 million compensation package for Dick Grasso, the former head of the supposedly non-profit exchange. Spitzer also investigated AIG over conflicts of interest in fraudulent accounting, forcing Hank Greenberg, AIG's longtime chairman and CEO, to resign. Both Langone and Greenberg are interviewed in Client 9 and hide none of their smug delight at Spitzer's downfall. Having pissed off the financial world, Spitzer went on to easily be elected governor of New York in 2006. The Democratic Party had begun to take notice of this rising star, with one person in the movie saying that Spitzer was basically the Obama before Obama, with murmurs that Spitzer might someday be America's first Jewish president. But things wouldn't be so easy, as Spitzer's uncompromising style earned him enemies in both parties. Then the New York Times broke the escort story. Gibney conducted extensive interviews with Spitzer, who speaks at length about his career and the financial crisis, but seems unwilling or unable to explain why someone with so much to lose would take such huge risks. Client 9 takes a revealing look inside the world of high-end escorts, who are not runaways or abuse victims, but educated young women who can make thousands of dollars per hour as escorts to supplement their incomes, and are valued not just for sex and their looks, but for their intelligence, charm, and ability to hold a conversation with the city's elite. There's also the revelation that Ashley Dupree, who became famous as Spitzer's favorite call girl, was only with Spitzer once, but was ready to use her notoriety as a springboard for her career. Spitzer's real favorite was another woman, who Gibney interviewed and is portrayed in the film by an actress to hide her identity. But the most illuminating part of Client 9 is Gibney's examination of whether the investigation into Spitzer was actually a hit job organized by the powerful enemies he'd made in the financial and political worlds, who had plenty of motive to take him out. For example, why did the FBI suddenly become so interested in this particular escort service when their main target has historically been prostitution rings? Why was so much attention paid to the Johns in this case, which almost never happens? And why were there pages of information about Client 9, which was Spitzer, and practically nothing on anyone else? Roger Stone, a notorious lobbyist and self-proclaimed GOP hitman with a tattoo of Richard Nixon on his back, admits to writing a letter tipping off the FBI about Spitzer's use of escorts and was later accused of leaving threatening messages to Spitzer's father. Langone also implies that he was having Spitzer followed to get dirt on him. So what is there to be learned from this sordid tale reminiscent of a Greek tragedy? Maybe that in modern times, as was the case with Bill Clinton, the weapon of choice to assassinate someone isn't bullets, but scandal in a lazy, sex-crazed media. Or that when you take on the rich, powerful, and entitled, they'll fight back using deep pockets and a viciousness that no one person can withstand. Maybe it's that even the best, smartest, and most moral of us, and Spitzer appeared to be all of those, still fall prey to their inescapable, inexplicable human weaknesses. Or, in true noir fashion, maybe all you can say is, forget it, Elliot, it's New York City. I'm Jonathan Kim, and this is a Rethink Review. Jonathan, do you have a prompter? Uh, yeah, I kind of made one. Oh, okay, okay. cool. So, <laughs> I'm like, otherwise, man. <laughs> That's some impressive stuff. Okay, just to be clear real quick, I saw the film Casino Jack, not Casino Jack and the... And the United States, States of Money, United States of Money, which is giving me a documentary, which I, I of course, uh, definitely want to see. Um, so, uh, I don't think there's any doubt the New York Times got tipped off by somebody. I don't think, and Roger Stone, who uh, I, well, he and I, I don't know Roger Stone at all, but he and I actually have some some mutual friends. Really, he's a likable guy. That's what I hear. He's yeah. very charismatic he's a, he's a, and is very kind of upfront about his sleaziness. Totally, he's a yeah. very right. very charismatic guy, but he would do this. And he is always peddling uh, scandal stories um, about mainly about New Yorkers. But he like he'll be you know he's always suggesting just you know there's this story you should and I'm sure that you know he may well I don't know but he may well have gone to the New York Times. Is that the suggestion in the film? There's a suggestion that he actually went to the FBI with okay. a letter. But I read something else about how like the letter that he had sent might have been like backdated to seem like it happened at a different time. But uh, apparently he was also, but, Stone was also involved in the Willie Horton ads in, um, yes, in yeah. going to uh, Miami for the 2000 election, setting up demonstrations in Florida for the Brooks Brothers. He's very, he's very good at, he's yeah, very he's good at what he does. A, right, um, he's a political operative and a 
and a good one. But well, he also, of Roe. but he could yeah. have, uh, he could easily have gone to the FBI and then also tipped off somebody. But who knows? Because what you can't argue is that whether he was a hit job or not, it's unquestionably a valid news story, right. without well, doubt. Right. Here, this, this is. I just want to say this and put it out there. I think that prostitution should absolutely be legal. It's kind of yes, semi-legal definitely. now, where if there's a camera in front and you are paid to have sex, it's then okay. it's totally okay. If a camera is not there, then suddenly it's a crime. So it's just, also legal in one state. Right. Well, there, but there's you know. like there's states that have it legal. Yes. But you know, it should absolutely be legal. It's better for everyone involved if it's legal. But that being said, it is a crime, and if you're going to go after other people for you know and investigate them for crimes, you have to be expect that anything that you do is going to be up to scrutiny. You know, I just it's like I can't. It's but it's even, like even if it's not a crime, the fact that the married governor of New York is paying for sex, there's no way that's not an interesting story. Well, it's an inter but it's not it's not a crime. You know. it, it, well, it might not be a crime. Well, see, in this case, it was. But, but right, I mean, yeah. it's still like that's you know morality and hypocrisy, but whatever. And but in this case, it's like. Yeah, well, see, that, that's sort of what I mean. The interesting thing about he's the not movies, really a victim, is what I'm right. trying well, to. It, say. it makes him a tragic figure, partially. I mean, a, a lot of, of his own doing. Right. You know, because he was the one who caused that. And I mean, one of the very telling things in the film is, like I said, like how well he speaks about everything else. But then when he's right. actually asked about the about the scandal, he really kind of clams up, and you can't tell if it's just he just doesn't want to talk about it, or he doesn't understand himself why he did it. Like, cause, you know, really the big like in the in the review, there's a the young dark haired woman, and uh, her name's uh, Cece Sewall. She was the 23 year old CEO of the Emperor's Club VIP, which was mm -hmm. the which was the, uh, the escort service. The idea that he gave so much power over him to this 23 year old. You know, and also all the women that all the women that he was seeing. Although, you know, obviously a lot of what you pay for with those is the discretion is for no one to ever find out. But then there's also the question of how come Spitzer's name leaked out, but Vitter's name, David Vitter's name, didn't leak out during the DC Madam thing. The only reason why that name came out was because of Larry Flint. And but see, that that was another thing where it's like. But David Vitter also resigned in shame. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you know, That's but, right. He was just reelected. I got that confused. But, in, but yeah. in, you know, David Vitter is a Louisiana politician, and for Louisiana politicians, he's not actually that corrupt. Right. I know. Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, there's a long like there's 300 years worth of history of people. You know, there's there's a former governors that are that are still spending time in, in federal pins that were from right. Louisiana. Right. Edwin, Edwin so, Edwards. Like, yeah, Edwin Edwards. Uh, but you know, and, real, and his son. Right. But real quick about David Vitter, just to. You're right, of course, that in a sense there's something different there. But, of course, in uh, the other way, it was far worse. I mean, Elliot Spitzer did not. I'm sure that, that somebody on the attorney general staff, and I remember there were stories at the time, that, yeah, they had closed prostitution rings. But that was not in any way, shape, or form a priority in the Spitzer AG's office. While David Vitter is going around, uh, you know, sort of family values. He's right. a family oh, values and, guy. And don't, yeah. don't you know, think for a second that I'm defending anything. That oh, no, I know. I'm, I'm just, just no, 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 I'm not. I'm not. But, you know, you should follow Vitter on Twitter because everything that he says sounds like code to me. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm he, sure like, goes, you know, it's like, you just like, every, what, I, right after the election, he said, uh, he said, you know, uh, we, we've hit bottom here and I, or something. Right. Said, exactly. word about it and I was like, ha, <laughs> 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 see, one thing that was amazing to me is like, I, I was looking around online to find out like, Okay, so when the Vitter thing happened, what Democrats came out and called for his resignation? I could not find one, none at all. Yeah. And and when I, I I googled like Vitter prostitution Democrat re resign, I found Debbie Schlussel called for him to resign. Oh, nice. Sean, Sean Hannity and then a Louisiana GOP official, and he said, uh, let's see, Vincent Bruno said for his own good, the good of the party and the good of his family, he should resign. Jo quote, join the Democratic Party where they think that kind of behavior is okay. Yeah. Right. But, like, why did the Democrats let him go? Right, that's what we do. I mean, it's, I, I feel... Because, like because we... Because the Democrats don't like that what happened to Bill Clinton. We don't like the, like, you know, uh, go... I mean, this that's not what the Democrats are interested in. Uh, I think everyone's still kind of smarting from taking down a, a politician or, or trying to take down a politician like Bill Clinton when Newt Gingrich was sleeping with a con congressional staffer. You know, there's like, there, it's, it's still kind of tender. I, right. I mean, I, I understand it. I, although but also, I understand but, it, but, but I mean, Vitter, Vitter broke the law, though. I know, broke the law, and, and <laughs> right. it's a very old school well, but way. He's a, but he's a Republican. It's a very old school way. <laughs> but the way they've, and, the, and you know, it's like in the evangelical community, it's like, well, you know, it doesn't matter if you're lying 
because it's for the greater good. And so when you're, it's the same with Republicans. It doesn't matter if anything that you say about your personal life uh, doesn't come with what you say publicly. It's just that, you know, you're you're telling people to do better. Uh, you know, the, uh, Rush Limbaugh said that you know that the if we have hypocrisy, that just means that we're trying. Yeah, it's. Uh, by the way, I do. I it means like, hypocrisy is good it, to well, Republicans. Hypocrisy is. That means good. that you're you're actually aspiring to be better than Democrats. Do you ever <laughs> want to totally hang out with someone who's not a little hypocritical? But what? seriously, well, I don't think it's possible. Well, but yeah, it's so yeah. not interesting. People who are not hypocritical. I, I mean, look, I don't, I don't want to spend time with Rush Limbaugh, but hypocrites. Bring them on. Those are my friends. <laughs> but I, um, some of my best friends are hypocrites. I mean, I think that. But I think a lot of like with Republicans, it's just this feeling of like entitlement, where it's like we deserve to be in power. So right. whatever we do that keeps us in For power is okay. Yeah. But see, don't the Democrats ever yeah, think of you know, the Johnson, good? That's a great. But it's a great <laughs> thing that you did to look it up because yeah. First of all, I don't know whether Democrats make a lame political calculus that a damage David Vitter's seat we could win. Yeah, because we took so many seats from Republicans in this last cycle, or. It's just what, what uh, Tina was saying, that, that we don't, it's not in our political calculus, but that's too old. And the notion, it's the same notion that we're going to talk about, about reaching out across the aisle and Harry Reid saying we're prepared to work with him and Barack Obama saying they're not prepared to work with you. They don't have any no. interest in compromising, so shut up about compromising and hammer back. This is a world where we are split, wholly split, and you can't have one side getting punched in the face again and again and again, bleeding all their mouth, their teeth are scattered all over the place, and like say, you know what, let's shake hands and stop punching each other. You're not punching them! Yeah, it's Why like, would yeah. they stop? They're beating right, the crap right. out of you and you keep losing. Right. So next time some politician like David Bitter gets caught, hypocrisy, right. he should Absolutely. resign. Say it again and again and again. Humiliate Bitter, humiliate the party. Play the same game that they're being played against. Well, you. that's the thing. The guy who ran against Vitter, he sort of he uh, melancholy. He went he went out and tried to make the prostitution claim, but I think at this point it's too late. Yeah, it was but the it, race, but it's that also the, but, they, but in I'm telling you in Louisiana they go well that's not right. You shouldn't be saying that about him. That's a private matter. His his wife forgives him. We should just all move on. But, and that's a part of the culture in Louisiana. I'm just saying it's not a national seat. It's it's a very it's a there's you know three th three million people in that state and they're cool with it. And they got rid of the black people. And they got rid of the black people yeah. too. So, well, right. that's, but that, you know that's that's their the representative. Asians. He but, yeah. he represents the people the, of Louisiana and if and Joseph they Cal. clearly don't care. But if my so, last name's Dupuy, I can say if, uh, <laughs> these are my people. The governor of Louisiana is Mary Landro's uh, brother, Mitch Landro. Mm -hmm. If if he had been, he's not the governor. He's the mayor of New Orleans. It, I think um, he had been the lieutenant governor. He's one of them. Um, if he got caught in this scandal, uh, Louisiana uh, uh, mores aside, don't do you think Republicans for half a second in Louisiana or nationally, even if we're talking about the mayor of New Orleans, would not hammer him day after day after day after day after? Yeah, I think the Democrats should have. They should have buried him right when it yeah. came out, and so whenever they say Vitter, they hear prostitutes right. and. Bitter hooker. And then it would have been done, but now I think but, they I mean, when I hear bitter, long. I think diaper. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's there somewhere. Right. You well, know. Spe speaking of diapers, so, I mean, that's a claim that I guess is, is still sort of up for grabs, whether that's true or not. But one thing that you find out in the movie is that this claim that, that, um, that Spitzer always wore calf-length uh, black socks when he had sex, apparently, total lie. Total lie passed by Roger Stone. And he said well, he just made it up. And that no, he, he figured because it was so salacious and titillating that the media wasn't going to check up on it. And people still say it today, and he's admitted that he just made it up. But, yeah, but, it, just uh, keeps on, but it just keeps on rolling, and it serves the purpose. It. All right, we got to go. But real quick, uh, you're, I'm going to object to one thing you said, and it, 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 you probably could perhaps figure it out. <laughs> when you're like, the escorts are known just as much for sex as their intelligence or charm. Please. They're, no, they're young. And they're incredibly hot, and they have no uh, crackness to them. You crackness? Know. Yeah, they don't smoke what? crack. Um, <laughs> crackness. Yeah. And they no don't, crackness. They don't have okay. any uh, <laughs> crackidity. Um, so, like, yeah, I got it. They're known. They're also smarter and intelligent than your average hooker. 
uh, and the discretion is obviously huge. But they're incredibly beautiful, and they will have sex with you. Well, well, that, beautiful well, well that's the thing. I mean, like in the which makes them even more beautiful. Right. <laughs> they talk about it in the movie, and I mean, I, actually, I did some research looking at escort services, and they talked about like the girlfriend experience, like someone who they talk about what education they have and everything. And they actually in the movie they talk about uh, New York Confidential, which was which was an escort serv an, an escort service that got taken down, and the the um, the motto for New York Confidential is rocket fuel for winners, <laughs> and the idea is that like for these businessmen, you know, like you know, champions of the world, it's like hey, it's like you have this amazing girlfriend for a few hours who's smart and funny and talks to you and of course you know like blows her socks off and everything, but it's like you'll feel great, you'll go back to your desk and you'll make back those few thousand dollars in the first five minutes because you're gonna feel so awesome about yourself. It's seen as like a performance aid, like having a, yeah. a great car. So, which I think is, is really kind of an interesting way to look at it, where you normally doesn't, mm. one doesn't think of escorts that way. I'm not buying it. Um, the, well, uh, so try an escort. Maybe, who knows? Right, maybe yeah, you, I mean, maybe you'll you perform better to... here. You won't feel as emasculated. I can't spend $2,000 <laughs> to have sex. Well, it's, I think it's a tax write-off. It's is a it? performance aid. Uh, That's by the true. Way, it's like cable or internet. The yeah, Steven's. absolutely. Or getting your hair done. So <laughs> The uh, Steven Soderbergh film, uh, Girlfriend Experience, is, uh, I think, worth seeing. It was uh, uh, interesting to me, and, and I, I, didn't, I don't think I gave it that great a review, but uh, in hindsight, I think about it a lot. And how well, no, but I mean, how, like it was done so creatively. Good night, and, Cleveland. So it may have, it may have, uh, it sort of may have struck a bigger chord. Than I, I thought it was yeah. so so, but oh, and also I, I interviewed Alex Gibney about Sasha Gray is the who's yes, an actual that's right. porn star. Yeah. Um, but I interviewed uh, Alex Gibney, and we had a really interesting conversation about the movie, and also about films that he likes, and about film noir, because I think all of his recent movies have this sort of film noir sort of aspect to it where it seems like it starts small but then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and becomes about everything. Well, I'm so. looking forward to seeing Client 9. I'm looking forward to at some point seeing uh, uh, Casino Jack in the uh, United States of Money. Well, that's the documentary. No, I know. Oh, I okay. got that. Oh, just so the other one is just called Casino Jack. It I seems like they would have given them more Pay different names. Pay attention, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jonathan. Realthinkreviews.net, uh, KPFK. Um, and, Huffington Post. Uh, Huffington Post where you'll see this and also, of course, every Friday. You're on TYT. We'll be right back.